Immanuel Kant famously stated that there are three basic questions of philosophy. What can I know? What should I do? What can I hope for? And that these three questions are actually aspects of a more fundamental, more basic question. The question of what is a human being? Now, um, what is a human being? Was ist der Mensch? Right? Or, to put it differently, what is the human place in the cosmos? Die Stellung des Menschen im Kosmos. Right? This, in many ways, is going to be the main topic of our course. Philosophy of natural and social science. My name is Alexander Karegin. I am a lecturer in philosophy of science, but also of political theory. And I'm going to try to bring these two of my specialization uh, to bear uh, uh, on each other, you know, in the course of our time together. Um, and uh, um, in, in the next approximately 14 to 16 lectures, uh, I'm going to try to give you uh, the basic rundown, the, the overview of what I think are the most important, the most interesting, most productive, most stimulating ideas associated uh, uh, with these very momentous uh, words, right? Philosophy, I mean, the, the formal title of our course is Philosophy and Methodology of the Natural and the Social Sciences, a title uh, uh, which sounds really uh, um, extremely broad and extremely uh, megalomaniacal even, right? It's like, uh, in principle, you know, to do this topic justice, we would have to cover everything of value in human intellectual history. Obviously, we won't be able to do that uh, uh, in detail. Um, but at the same time, I, I do want, in the, you know, in the course of these 14 to 16 lectures, I do want uh, um, to give us a chance to look at the most basic, most fundamental issues that humanity has been able to, you know, to interrogate, to come, the questions that humanity has been able to come up with, and at least on some methodological level, try to see um, what, what the answers are, or maybe, if not what the answers are, what is the methodology for answering these questions, or, you know, what, what, what it could look like, right? So how does, how does um, our worldview hang together, so to speak, in the words of an American philosopher, from how does our worldview fit together, hang together from protons to presidents and from electrons to elections. Now, the, <laughs> the most important idea in our course, and I actually think that there's a single most important idea that actually unifies the natural and the social sciences. And this, in some sense, uh, uh, could be called like the long scientific revolution, the long view of the scientific revolution. And this is the uh, replacement of the like ancient, traditional, archaic, primitive, teleological worldview, we're replacing this, with a new mechanistic worldview. And I want to say that this transformation from the like original teleological understanding of the world to this new mechanistic world worldview is the most important transformation in the intellectual history of humanity period like in all of intellectual history of humanity. And um, like foreshadowing this a little bit, you know, if, if we were to approach this in a historical fashion, and you know, so, um, I'm sometimes tempted to include um, excursions into history of science, although we don't have quite all that much time to, to go into that. But if, if you look, and uh, uh, um, I'm starting here with the Western tradition, but of course you can go and look at traditions outside the West, which is an important <laughs> reminder, right? Uh, uh, that philosophy has existed outside the West. Philosophy and science has existed outside the West. But at least, you know, within the Western corpus, you know, if you start from philosophers such as Thales, through Copernicus, through Darwin, through Turing, right? There's, there's a certain, again, displacement of, uh, uh, inten you know, notion of intention, purpose, goal, with the notions of um, blind... Uh, mechanistic, uh, you know, often mathematical in structure, uh, patterns of causation, um, kind of taking this world which is familiar, full of purposes, goals, values, and making this familiar world, making it strange, explaining it in terms of blind, mechanistic, mathematical regularities, right? And, you know, Th Thales, Copernicus, Darwin, and Turing 
are uh, uh, certain goalposts um, in terms of this, again, again, the, the natural and the social sciences, in terms of the natural sciences. But then if we also look at the humanities, and I, this is what I talk about, the two worldviews, right? The two worldviews, the, the, the sort of the hard sciences worldview, Thales, from Thales to Turing, and, the, and then you have the humanities, <laughs> right, the social sciences worldview. And when, when we look at the social sciences worldview, if, when we look at philosophers such as Nietzsche, Freud, Marx, and also very dear to my heart, philosophers such as uh, Jacques Lacan, Michel Foucault, right, I see actually, you know, in, in very different style, in very different words, coming from a very different place, but the same conclusion. And the, the convergence, right, from Thales to Turing and from Nietzsche to Foucault. And kind of both of these pictures seem to converge on the same point, right? And, and, and this, is, this is what fascinates me. So um, let, me, let me immediately say, I do, I'm deeply passionate about philosophy, and I see philosophy as a deeply, deeply practical enterprise, right? So again, go back to these questions asked by Kant. What am I? What is a human being? That, that's a very important question. And also, again, as opposed to this, you know, uh, 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 Cartesian complacency, or uh, maybe as opposed to um, this uh, kind of, you know, naive complacency of this uh, individual self-transparent autonomous homo economicus, right? It's not a very simple question to answer. What am I? What, what am I? Do I really know what I am, right? But anyway, so what am I? This is the, the, the most important question according to Kant, right? What can I know? What can I hope for? But these questions importantly link to the notion of what should I do? And presumably, what should we do collectively, right? Because, you know, there's a certain individual project. What do you do with your life? What do you choose to do with your life? But also, uh, uh, you know, human beings, Aristotle will tell us, uh, zoon politikon, human beings are deeply social. We are, we are social beings, right? We, you know, human, human children don't survive outside of societies. We are in this together. So there's a certain interesting uh, um, interplay going between our individual projects, but also between our collective projects. So what should I do individually? What should we do collectively? So mm -hmm, I see philosophy as a deeply practical enterprise, and I see philosophy as continuous with the sciences, with the natural sciences, but also with political science. But uh, uh, like, when, when you ask when you define philosophy in this way, it's it's difficult to imagine why would somebody not be interested in doing philosophy, right? Taking the deepest questions about what we are and trying to bring them to bear on what we should do with our lives, right? It's like, if you do not think for yourself, others think for you, right? Socrates, at the beginning of our discipline, says the unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. Why would you not be interested in philosophy? Now, so, so I'm, I'm pretty certain that the questions that we're asking in this course are worthwhile questions. Now, are the answers satisfactory? You know, I hope that they will be stimulating, that you will find them interesting. I definitely try my best, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, and but also, also, the ancient Greeks had this notion of philosophy as therapy, philosophy as therapy, philosophy being to the soul what medicine is to the body. And I very much share uh, this pr practical but also therapeutic uh, outlook. And I want to say that because of the nature of the, you know, these large questions that we're asking in this course, necessarily this course is a bit of a work in progress. Because I want to say that this transition from the teleological to the mechanistic worldview, this is a transition in progress, right? This, this is it. I, I want to say this is the most important transformation in the history of humanity. This is definitely the most important intellectual transformation that I had in my intellectual biography. But also, you know, if you look outside the window, I would say that this is a transformation that is going on right now. It's an ongoing project. It's an unfinished project, right? And uh, often I'm going to be talking about things which are at the edge of my own understanding, at the edge of humanity's self-understanding, you know, the deepest problems, problems of free will or problems of consciousness, nature of consciousness, right? Uh, problems of, uh, you know, complexity, <laughs> you know, emergence and reductionism, these kinds of ideas. These are at the edge of human understanding. So, and I definitely, you know, I, I invite you uh, uh, into these wonderful issues. I invite you into the dialogue to think through these uh, issues, to think uh, these issues together with me. And I think that there's a deep value in me talking to students who are not professional philosophers, right? Um, um, and 
I definitely I want to see my st students as my colleagues in an important respect in this course. Hopefully by the end of these 14 lectures, you will have learned from me, but I will also will have learned from you. Uh, so, you know, obviously in my capacity as a professional philosopher, I talk to my uh, uh, colleagues, properly speaking, in the academia, and, and there's value in that. But I also feel that there's a very important element of reality check. Am I able to explain these high fluten subjects in simple, straightforward terms. If I'm hoping for philosophy to be practical and therapeutic, uh, if I'm hoping for philosophy to be public, to contribute to public debate in the civil, in, you know, in the sphere of civil society, Antonio Gramsci says hi, and he'll say hi from time. To, he'll be saying hi from time to time. I should be able to explain these ideas. I should be able to talk about these ideas <laughs> on some simple, straightforward level, right? This should not be an esoteric discipline, or at least not entirely an esoteric discipline. So I feel that there's a deep value in me talking again to uh, first, second, and third year uh, uh, students, but also you know I'm posting these lectures uh, uh, on my YouTube channel for the whole world to see. So we'll see. Uh, um, we'll see what comes out from that, right? And and there's there's a there's a, a, a deep element, right? Uh, um, how should I put this? Like um, this tradition of philosophers not being locked up in ivory towers and only talking to other philosophers, you know, like the medieval scholastics, for example, <laughs> used to do. But you know, I'm trying to tap in. Into, into this other tradition in the history of philosophy, tradition most readily associated with the name of Socrates, right, who went into the streets of Athens, into the Agora, into the marketplace, presumably talking to anybody who would listen, right? So this is, I, I want to see myself in that capacity. Anyway, anyway, so, uh, so again, so I already mentioned, right, so I, I want to say that the, the most important question of the course is what is a human being? And the most important a answer of the course, right, this tentative provisional hypothetical answer of the course, because as we will learn, science doesn't really deal in truth, but science deals in uh, 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 levels of probability, if you want, um, Bayesian credences, right, uh, uh, inference to, to, the, to, to, the, to the best explanation, right, something like that, uh, um, like w what seems most probable, right? And so, so, you know, in, in this hypothetical re reconstruction, when we try to a answer what are human beings, right, so we, we get into this mechanistic attempt to explain away all purposes of teleology. So we take the world which is familiar. It, it seems that the world is our home. We're born into this world, and it seems to some extent this world is our, is our home. The major, let's say, religious traditions of the world will talk about how mm, everything in this world happens for a reason. Like if you have a pimple on your forehead or a splinter in your toe or Jupiter forbid, your loved one, you know, gets in a car accident or something like this. All of this, all, all is for the best in this best of all possible worlds. Everything is in its place. So this is the familiar teleological picture to some extent has this connotation of wishful thinking. The mechanistic worldview um, is very much, you know, it's alien, it's hostile, it, it, it draws a picture of the world in which human beings are not at home. And this is, this is not a happy place. In fact, the evolution of the whole universe, you know, in contemporary, let's say, philosophy of physics, uh, 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 I'm going to have an occasion to talk about this wonderful formula somewhere down the line, which is an increase in entropy, increase in entropy towards the heat death of the universe. Again, I'm reminded of this phrase by Shakespeare, right, that life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing right it's a very bleak picture so so kind of mechanistic explanation non-teleological explanation of human nature again i'm jumping ahead uh, uh trying to uh, uh take from scientific revolution from thales to turing but also from nietzsche to foucault right so the picture that we get is of human beings as essentially anxious beings and in fact mostly unconscious beings, right? So we, we, we understand certain things about ourselves, we make certain choices, but most of our life we are una unaware of, as Nietzsche says, uh, we don't control, don't understand, don't even feel the workings of the coils of our intestines. So much of our life is actually hidden from us, right? So Nietzsche talks about this, Freud obviously talks about this idea of the unconscious. So we are deeply anxious, driven by unconscious desires, right? And in fact, if we think about this 
uh, carefully from various angles, examine this from various angles, we're actually products of larger structural forces, larger structural forces. What are these forces? Forces, broadly speaking, I'm jumping to conclusions, I'm trying to give you the conclusion of the course at the, at the outset, forces of biological and cultural evolution, biological and cultural evolution. Now, the word evolution has positive connotations, you know, <laughs> there's nothing positive about the idea of evolution within the mechanistic picture, because this evolution is about blind mechanistic selection pressure. So you have biological evolution or cultural evolution, you have this blind mechanistic selection pressure, selection pressure in terms of efficiency for the sake of efficiency. So, uh, if you want, if efficiency in what? <laughs> efficiency in increasing entropy, right? <laughs> Towards the heat death of the universe, again, this, in the service of this inexorable second law of thermodynamics, right? As uh, 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 geologist Mike Russell, geologist and chemist Mike Russell puts it, the purpose of life is to convert, uh, I think it's uh, 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 CO2 into methane, <laughs> right? <laughs> convert CO2 into CH4, right? Uh, and the, definitely our purpose, so, so, so we, we are manufactured by these forces of biological and cultural evolution in order to fulfill a certain function within the logic of perpetuation of these systems of biological and cultural evolution to, to, to try to make these systems more efficient, not to be happy, right? But, but, but only to fulfill a certain function, right? And so we want things, this is a very kind of Heideggerian, Lacanian thought, we want things that we do not really need. But the things that we truly need, like lasting satisfaction and finding meaning in life, are the things that we cannot in principle get. It's kind of a nature, a bleak, you know, to some extent, bleak, nat bleak nature uh, uh, of, the, of the human predicament. We, we are stuck, but we are st thrown into this world, thrown without a manual, but stuck in this together, right? And uh, kind of in our course, uh, I'm going to try to kind of show the, the, the reasons for this picture, why, why this is our worldview today. And uh, um, also to, to, to ask a very important question, what should we do about this picture? And this is where my, uh, uh, actually my main profession, because by, by trade, I'm first and foremost a political philosopher. This is, this is where I'm going to be able to talk a little bit about, a, a little bit about that. So philosophy, moral philosophy and political philosophy, what, the question of value, what should we do about this? Anyway, 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 so again, 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 so uh, 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 we'll see if we have time, but definitely there's a, there's a, there's a place for, for, for an interesting excursion into the history of, a, uh, mm, of science, potentially could be a whole different course about how mechanistic worldview gradually, not com even, even today, not completely, but gradually replaces step by step the teleological worldview. And again, it's not like, it's a, it's not like I have a knockdown argument in favor of this picture, but um, I want to say I feel and again, the nature of scientific truth is something that we're going to have to talk about. But I feel that uh, even though in principle it's possible, if, you, if you're very clever, if you work at it, to wiggle out, to weasel your way out of the mechanistic worldview, I think our time and effort is much better spent trying to understand the mechanistic worldview and trying to understand its implications rather than trying to, you know, appeal to arguments of, you know, like, God of the gaps, soul of the gaps, freedom of the gaps, meaning of the gaps, teleology of the gaps. If you didn't understand what I said right now, don't worry too much. We'll have an occasion to return back to this. Anyway, so um, one thing that we're going to have to do as we go along in the course is trying to build like a, a holistic, systematic picture of, of the universe, again, as, as it hangs together, so to speak, from protons to presidents and from electrons to elections. Uh, again, it's, it's a phrase due to a, actually a controversial American philosopher, John Searle. Um, and, well, anyway, and as he says, kind of the task of philosophy is to understand how does our account of ourselves as mindful, meaning, meaningful, autonomous agents, how does it fit, fit in with our understanding of basic reality as comprised of mindless, meaningless, deterministic energy fluctuations? Basically, again, like we have this notion of the quantum fields, so, and the, the, the quantum fluctuations seeking uh, lower or lowest energy states, like a ball rolling downhill. So some question of uh, determinism here, I'm going to in, in, uh, insist on the, our, on, on the deterministic uh, uh, understanding of uh, 
quantum mechanics, deterministic interpretations of quantum mechanics, but you know, we'll have an occasion to talk about this down the line. Right? And it's kind of very interesting because Immanuel Kant, again, whom I already had an occasion to mention, actually wrote in a, in a famous uh, letter to his friend that he thinks that this is the most important task of philosophy <laughs> several hundred years ago, right? Uh, to understand how does an immortal soul <laughs> fit into this mechanistic reality. But again, so the, the question is similar, but I think the answer that we're going to give is going to be very different from, from Kant's answer. So this is a very interesting picture, which is due to Sean Carroll. And uh, again, it's a bit of a preview. I don't want to spend too much time on this right now. Again, like this is this is the like the, the, the history of the universe in, in one picture. So we go from the big, you know, from our understanding of the Big Bang. Uh, we don't really understand. We don't really have a theory of the Big Bang. The Big Bang is uh, kind of is the, is the limit. Um, the, the moment of the Big Bang is, as we approach the moment of the Big Bang, our best theories actually break down. So you might have heard about quantum gravity, but still, we have this account of the, of the evolution of the cosmos, right? And so you have increasing entropy, increasing disorderliness, but uh, as the disorder is increasing, you have this emergent complexity. And uh, uh, some, somewhere, somewhere close to the top, so like we we find ourselves in the in this middle posi middle position, and I'm going to have an occasion to return back to this picture. Uh, kind of we, we are stuck in this time when there's something interesting and complex going on, but it's not moving towards a happy ending because you know at so at some point in the future of the universe, as far as our best theories, physical theories tell us, the entropy is going to take over and the universe is going to proceed to the heat death in this bleak picture uh, where everything is going to be, you know, sort of all of the energy in the universe is going to dissipate so much so that even stable atoms will be impossible and uh, the universe will turn into a cold, dark, bleak place where nothing interesting is happening, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, and uh, um, so I keep, I keep referring to this formula. This is the, Lagrange, the, this is the Lagrangian of the standard model of particle physics but actually a, a more complete formula, although expressed more concisely, this is due to Frank Wilczek, uh, 2004 Nobel Prize winner in physics. Uh, so this is the so-called core theory, which includes our best understanding of uh, quantum mechanics and gravity um, in the domain of applicability, or regimes of applicability. Again, we'll talk about this more down the line. Um, so there's a whole issue, again, uh, uh, um, and so at some point, we're going to have to devote a whole chunk, maybe, of, of, a, of a lecture in the future to de des describing in detail of what exactly uh, uh, is the notion of the mechanistic versus the teleological worldview, right? So uh, 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 we're talking about abstract principles as opposed to intentions, right? So we're talking about blind causes as opposed to meaningful purposes, right? There's a certain kind of symmetry in this formula, how anything can be turned into anything else, right? And uh, also very importantly that in this picture, in this formula, there are no natural values. Again, as Thomas Hobbes, one of my favorite philosophers of all times, says, whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite or desire is that which he, for his part, calls good. And the object of his hate and aversion is what man calls evil. But there is nothing simply and absolutely good or evil, right? So kind of Hobbes is foreshadowing Nietzsche. This is Nietzsche before Nietzsche. Kind of God is dead and values are valueless. The revaluation of values uh, 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 before Nietzsche. And of course, as we are discussing the mechanistic worldview, the uh, uh, very important notion is going to be the idea of evolution. In many ways, the idea of evolution, uh, uh, because on the mechanistic worldview, uh, uh, we, we, we need to explain how order, how apparent order emerges from chaos, right? Uh, like, like, again, on, 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 the, on this picture, on this graph, right? There's emergent complexity, it's kind of an appearance of order emerges from chaos, and the the, the short answer uh, is evolution. Is evolution again? Um, and there's also this kind of issue which I kind of want to signal. But it's a, it's a deep issue and issue which is difficult to get into. Again, this notion of process ontology that actually what exists in the world are not stable things but only processes. And again, I have this uh, quote from the heart, from the Buddhist Heart Sutra here, which is very famous. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. And uh, uh, I'm trying to compare this to Heraclitus's no idea of becoming, Heraclitus's becoming, right? Uh, how nothing actually 
is, but everything is becoming constantly. Uh, 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 and, you know, even, so tables don't exist, chairs don't exist, even atoms, stable atoms don't exist. Everything is, you know, repeating fluctuations and you don't exist, right? So the homeostasis of your body is due to constant processes, right? So human, human individuals are, you know, assemblages of, you know, vast arrays of different organs, but you know, on a deeper level, assemblages of vast arrays of cells. And these cells in principle in potentially could be in conflict with one another. So, and like the, co the continuity in an important sense is an illusion. Am I the same person I was a moment ago? Well, if you believe, again, contemporary physics, well, no, not exactly, right? From moment to moment, we change. And uh, 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 again, this interesting kind of evolutionary picture that talks about kind of particular forces that force my atoms and my molecules and my, my cells into a stable configuration, or I, I should say apparently stable configuration, okay, but I don't want to talk about everything at the same time, but I'm trying to give a bit of a preview, right? So another issue that we're going to have to deal with in the course is uh, uh, methodological problems with this entire picture, because as you can see, I'm making very bold statements over and over and over again, as if we understand everything uh, uh, about society, but it's about society, about humans, about physics, but it's not exactly true, right? So, you know, if you look at this formula, do we know that this formula is true with capital T? Well, no, not exactly, right? So there's uh, uh, all sorts of issues having to do with empiricism, skepticism, fallibilism, uh, uh, and ultimately it seems that what we have in the sciences is not truth with a capital T, but something like social consensus, which is akin to a political consensus. And this is where my training as a political philosopher uh, uh, comes in. And there's a whole bunch of issues that, again, we're going to have to deal with, uh, at least in some level. And again, I'm not sure if I'll be able to devote enough time in the lectures to all of this, but definitely in the seminars, I want to give a chance to all of you to present your own ideas in speech, but also in writing. So if any, if any of this, if any of these topics interest you, definitely feel free to pursue them. Uh, like provisionally, I think we're gonna have three oral presentations in speech and then one written essay. So you have a, <laughs> several topics you can choose, right? But these issues about ancient skepticism, problem of the criterion, modern skepticism, this, uh, the Cartesian demon, some of you might have heard about this, problem of induction, problem of deduction, this hermetic circle issue of theory of an observation, you know, pragmatism, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, 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 But at the end of the day, kind of trying to bring this closer to home and maybe uh, uh, trying to say this in a more clear way, right? So on the one hand, if you deal with uh, fundamental philosophy, especially with philosopher such as David Hume, the skeptical philosopher par excellence, right? So David Hume gives us a picture which is deeply, deeply skeptical, right? When you read Descartes or when you read Hume, you experience this skeptical vertigo, feeling of complete loss of ground beneath your feet. You, like, who am I? Where do I come from? Do, can I even trust that the laws of gravity will hold in the next moment? Will I trust that this Water will not poison me the next time that I take a sip. And it seems that, no, I cannot be sure of that. <clears throat> but at the same time, at the same time, it's kind of an interesting, a bit of a paradox. Even though, philosophically speaking, there's, there seems to be no foundation and no justification for our uh, scientific beliefs. But at the same time, the vast majority of humanity, the vast majority of human beings alive, have this automatic habitual certainty, right? So, like, as I am recording this lecture, every step of the way, I trust that the, the universe, the laws of the universe will continue, uh, you know, in, in the, their regular course, that the water to con will continue to not poison me, the air will continue to be breathable, and you kind of, the, the, the laws of the universe will continue to hold, even though, even though there's no real reason, no deep, apodictic, knockdown, watertight reason to believe that that is so. And that's kind of an interesting issue in and of itself. Now, Another issue that I want to signal, although again, it's not clear how much time we're going to have to devote to it, is uh, uh, again, this issue of natural versus social sciences. So um, I'm going to, broadly speaking, try, you know, I'm, I'm teaching this course from a naturalist, materialist perspective. So I will want to say that at the, at the end of the day, uh, there is no unbridgeable gap between the natural and the social sciences. And especially again, this, uh, again, mechanistic versus teleological worldview. You can see this in Freud, uh, Lacan, and Foucault, but, and you can also see this in Turing. So I don't see, I don't think that there's a conflict, but at the same time, you know, throughout the history of uh, uh, philosophy of science, if you read 
uh, uh, a classical book on philosophy of science like this one, wonderful book by Martin Hollis. Right? He will talk extensively, and this is, this is a part uh, 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 of the standard history of philosophy of science and history of science. Right? Is it the case that natural and social sciences have the same methodology? Right? The famous Methodenstreit right, that uh, uh, took place in the German academia. Uh, um, and again, I'm, I will uh, um, try to give you a picture from the standpoint of the unity of science, again, these ideas of complexity, emergence, reductionism. If you want, like, emergence of complexity, and ultimately that the methodological assumption is that it is possible, at least in principle, to reduce the social sciences to the more basic natural sciences. In principle, but not necessarily in practice. Again, uh, 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 another issue. Okay, so, actually, so this was, this was maybe um, a bit too vague, so let me talk some more about what I find kind of the most important uh, uh, takeaway point, like the, the, the point of our lecture course, which I feel is closest to home, right? And this is, again, talking about what is the human being? What am I? This is, in, in many ways, I feel the most important question that we're asking in the course. And um, when you try to answer, to answer this question, you can look from the inside or from the outside at the human being, right? So from the inside is basically you close your eyes and you introspect. And, but from the, or from the outside, you can go and take a biology class and, you know, do a, like a d dissection and, you know, look at your tissues from the, from the microscope, right? And uh, uh, in a very important uh, um, way, right, so this, 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 at least for me, uh, uh, there's a story, I'm not sure if it's true, but <laughs> about, a, about a dispute between two wonderful German philosophers, Helmut Pleissner and Martin Heidegger, right? And Pleissner uh, famously said that you have to begin from the outside. You have to give an external account of human nature in terms of human biology. And Heidegger said, no, you have to start from the inside. You have to give an internal account of the human nature from, you know, phenomenology, right? Uh, uh, but I want to say, my, my idea is that actually it doesn't matter where you start, there's convergence. So my, my own notion is that there's convergence between the two, between the two accounts. And, and this is, in many ways, again, like the most important takeaway point uh, from our course in general, but especially from this first uh, lecture, right? And I actually, I have a few quotes which I love and I want to share with you. This is, a, this is a quote that I always give as we begin talking about kind of approaching the human beings from the outside and from the inside. This is a quote from the inside. This is a br brilliant quote from a Nobel Prize uh, 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 winning writer. Mm, William Golding from a beautiful book, Darkness Visible. So, um, you know, let's, let, let's take a moment, let's take a, a bit of a step back, let me, let me indulge in this quote. Uh, it's, a, it's a quote which has been haunting me ever since I read it uh, for the first time, and it's a bit of an epigraph to, the, to, the, to this course, I want to say, right? Um, so he's talking about a young girl, approximately 15 years of age, and uh, her grandmother just recently died, and this led to some interesting thoughts in her, in her head, right? So <clears throat> let me read you the quote. So it was at that very point that Sophie, the girl, made her discovery. The mystery of things and her grandmother dying drove Sophie in on every side into herself. So we're starting from the inside, introspection. Sophie understood something about the world. The world extended out of her head in every direction but one. And that one was secure because it was her own. It was the direction through the back of her head, there which was dark like the night, but her own dark. She knew that she stood or lay at the extreme end of this dark direction as if she was sitting at the mouth of a tunnel, the dark tunnel at the back of the head, right? And looking out into the world, whether it was dusk or dark or daylight. When she understood that the tunnel was there at the back of her head, she felt a strange kind of shiver that shot through her body and made her want to escape from it into the daylight and be like everybody else. But there was no daylight. She imagined the daylight then and there and filled it with people who had no tunnel at the back of their heads, gay, cheerful, ignorant people. And then she fell asleep. Again, I feel, I feel it's a beautiful, beautiful quote, right? So, and uh, 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 again, this image of the dark tunnel at the back of the head. And <laughs> in an important sense, I have this picture of Rene Descartes, right? So this idea, what is inside the black box? 
what is inside the, the dark tunnel, right? At the back of the head. Uh, uh, um, right? And, and I want to oppose this picture that we get from Golding, but we also get from Heidegger, we also get from Freud and from Nietzsche, uh -huh. so, okay. this unconscious motivation. I want to oppose this picture to a kind of naive Cartesian complacency or this kind of naive complacency of the rational autonomous homo economicus, right? So these are going to be two of the targets in my course, but especially, again, I have this picture of Descartes, which I sometimes hang <laughs> behind me, every, you know, every lecture to remember that this is, this is our target, right? And so... Um, Mm, okay, so this is a bit of a, probably the wrong slide. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, so 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 if we look at, again, this convergence, I, I want to say at the end of the day, and, and this, this, this to me uh, uh, was a deep, uh, I don't want to say revelation, but kind of a, a deep moment of insight, insight that the, the external account of human nature from the outside and the internal account of the human nature from the sorry, internal account from the inside and the external account from the outside that at the end of the day, they converge, right? So if you start, let's say, from the outside, right? So in terms of the hard sciences, again, this picture from protons to presence or from electrons to elections, there's a certain vision of the unity of science, right? If you want from physics to geopolitics. So <laughs> international relations by this standard is the most complex phenomena that exists uh, uh, in the universe or, or that, that we can discover in the universe. So it's somewhere close to the peak of complexity. So if you had a galactic federation, right, it would be even more complex. But of the things that we can observe now, it's not the black holes, it's not the neutron stars, but it is the human brain, it is the system of human brains, society, and it is the system of society, the international geopolitical system, which is at the pillar of complexity. When I talk about this to international relations students, they're always delighted, right? The most complex subject in existence, subject in existence is international relations, right? So from, from physics to geopolitics, again, you have this picture of the unity of science, right? So, and you have fundamental physics, which on the basis of fundamental physics, you get chemistry, which is just <laughs> sort of applied physics, if you want. But then on top of chemistry, you have like a, as a branch of chemistry, you have organic chemistry. As a part of that, you have cellular biology emerging from organic chemistry. And, uh, uh, you know, for many people, it's hard to imagine, but we, we have this pinned down to a very high degree of accuracy. I mean, you know, uh, 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 taking uh, various pharmaceuticals, reading food labels, or, or taking vaccines relies on our understanding that cellular biology is completely reducible to organic chemistry. Cellular biology is completely reducible to organic chemistry. Every experiment we have been able to do, every observation we have been able to do uh, reliably and robustly shows that there is nothing in, you know, as opposed to these ideas of, you know, vitalism, about Elan Vital, no, there's nothing uh, interesting or magical about life. Life is just a certain kind of organic uh, uh, chemical process, right? And so uh, then on top of the cellular biology, you have uh, multicellular organisms, and ultimately down the line you have group selection, and then uh, uh, um, on the basis of these selective pressures in terms of group selection, you have evolution psychology, evolution of psychology, and then, therefore, you have social science, social psychology, political science, economics, all this kind of stuff, right? But I want to say that from, in this picture, from protons to presidents, notice, not from protons to black holes, but from pro, in, in terms of complexity, from protons to presidents, and from electrons to elections, from physics, fundamental physics, to geopolitics, right? So this is, this is how complexity rises. From fundamental physics, then the universe cools down, when I say the universe, obviously I mean the observable patch of the universe. Anyway, when it cools down, you get the emergence of chemistry. Then, when it cools down a bit more, you have these explosions of the supernova, etc., uh, etc. Et you know, uh, gas clouds collapse. You have emergence of you know uh, planets um, with uh, you know in the Goldilocks zone where liquid water is possible. You know, it's a hypothetical story, you understand. Then emergence of biology. So it's like you understand on 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 this picture. First, you get physics in terms of time, history of the universe, right? There was, at some point, it was too hot for chemistry as we know it. At some point, it was too hot for biology as we know it, right? So first there's physics, then there's chemistry, then there's biology, and then kind of biology evolves organisms. So, so kind of, you understand, right? Psychology and social science emerges in time, later in time. It's kind of, it's kind of this uh, temporal, and but also ontological precedence. So uh, physics emerges before, but it is also more fundamental ontologically in the sense that it is more real, in the sense that presidents behave the way they do because protons behave the way they do. Elect elections 
you know, uh, uh, operate the way they do because electrons operate the way they do, right? So this is kind of, uh, you understand, right? In terms of basic reality, uh, elections rely on electrons, not the other way around, right? Um, um, so this is this is the picture from, from the outside, right? <laughs> And it, it points later down the line. So you have, you know, sort of in, in terms of the hard sciences of the human beings, you sort of, I don't know, neuroscience, cognitive science, behavioral economics. You have, uh, for example, Daniel Kahneman's, Kahneman is somewhere over here, right? Daniel Kahneman's idea of, uh, 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 maybe I should uh, uh, point this a bit more, right? Uh, uh, of bounded rationality, right? Uh, 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 the two, oops, the two track model. The uh, uh, dual systems theory, right? Uh, slow thinking and fast thinking, and this modular theory of the mind. Again, remember, human beings are anxious, mostly unconscious, products of larger force of biological and cultural evolution. Kahneman seems to agree with that. Modular theory of the mind seems to agree with that. This is the out account from the outside. But then, if we look at the account from the inside, if we look at the account from the inside, and I haven't been able to come up with uh, 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 equally uh, elegant formulation as protons, presidents, elections, selections, but I want to say how you get from hunger to history, from the, your immediate introspective experience of hunger to the understanding that you are part of human history, or how you get from, from an uh, uh, automatic urge to say good morning to the, again, the, the genealogy in a you know, Nietzschean or Foucauldian uh, way of understanding, again, that, that you are a part of something larger. You are a product of larger forces, right? So from hunger to history, from good morning to genealogy, we'll see, right? So, so immediately when we do kind of, in, when we introspect, humans have been doing this for thousands of years, obviously, uh, and Plato has, has, has done this, right? And Buddha, the Buddhist tradition is always, is, is also a very important interlocutor for me in, the, in this course, right? But immediately, most immediately, I want to associate introspection with phenomenology and psychoanalysis, phenomenology and psychoanalysis, Heide Heidegger's phenomenology and psychoanalysis of Freud and Lacan, right? And again, this notion that you find yourself, if you close your eyes and try to understand, you find yourself emerging from the unconsciousness of the deep sleep in the early morning, or you find yourself emerging from the unconsciousness of early babyhood somewhere in your biographical history, right? But you find yourself thrown into this world, thrown into this world without a manual, but also you find yourself with certain beliefs, values, and desires which are given to you. Uh -huh. So we make choices, but we make choices on the basis of things that we don't choose. Again, beliefs, values, and desires are things that we find ourselves with. We don't choose them. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and what, what I'm driving at is that if you look very carefully on the inside, inside points outside. In our, again, when we close our eyes and introspect, we see this dark tunnel and we, we are prompted, we are tempted to, to ask this question, what is on the other side of this dark tunnel? So inside points outside, if you want, right? So inside this left side of the board points, points outside to the right side of the board, right? Uh, basically, uh, 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 two things, phenomena, structures which pre-exist my birth, right? So I have been born, but I have been born into a culture. I have been born into a, which, which I haven't made, which I haven't chosen. I, ha I have been born into a certain language, which I haven't made, I haven't chosen, which are all results of history. Again, this idea of that individuality, human individuality, what, what am I? Again, remember Immanuel Kant, what is a human being? Was ist der Mensch, right? Individuality is linguistically constituted. We, we, we are, you know, to the extent we are rational, we rely on, on language. But language is constituted by culture. Language, kind of rationality, is linguistic and therefore historical. Therefore historical. It points to something greater than ourselves. I'm thinking of Hegel, of course. I'm thinking of Nietzsche. I'm thinking of Marx, right? Very important. Again, this, Nietzsche talks about this ideas of genealogy. Geneal genealogy, understanding where do we come from, right? And so... Uh, uh, Again, in terms of, just, just to wrap this up a bit, right, so in terms of, again, thinking from the inside, uh, we find, you know, in terms of introspection, the, the kind of the biological drives, Freud and Lacan, I want to point to these two characters. Also, uh, Maurice, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, but I'm not really an expert on Merleau-Ponty, but I just want to mention his name here, right? But also in terms of, again, of culture, right, so this, for me, the three names that I would sing, single out would be Nietzsche, Marx, and Foucault. But, and for me, the idea is that the inside and the outside both converge in the, in the same direction. So what I'm driving at is that 
What Kahneman says is basically compatible with what Freud and Lacan say. Uh -huh. What the modular theory of the mind says is basically compatible with what Heidegger and Foucault says. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. You see, you see what I'm, and, and what are they saying? That human beings are anxious, mostly unconscious products of larger forces of biological and cultural evolution. That we are manufactured by these forces, not to be happy, but only to fulfill a certain function in the perpetuation of the logic of these systems, blind, deterministic, mechanistic systems of these biological and cultural evolution. Right, right. So mechanistic, non-teleological explanation of the world, both in terms of the inside and of, on the, in terms of the outside. Okay. Okay, okay, yeah. So, in again, what am I? <laughs> I find that I am not really substantial. I am not an immortal, self-transparent, uh, uh, you know, self-controlling immortal soul. But in fact, again, this notion associated with the French post-structuralist, the death of the subjects, the, the death of the subject, there, there is no self. I don't exist in an important level. Say hi to Buddha. I don't exist in, an, in, a, in a very important sense. I am just a conglomerate. It's kind of this flow of appearances and impressions. Just a, a meditative pause. So, uh, 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 so Buddha, Marx, and Foucault. So Buddha's Marxism and post-structuralism, to me, are kind of the, the, the three uh, uh, constellations of ideas which are super important in, kind of in, in terms of... Uh, uh, organizing my understanding of, the, of, the, of this subject that I'm teaching, right? And uh, so again, so I'm talking about the, co the convergence of the two worldviews on this notion of the death of the subject, that actually by the end of this course, I hope to be able to convince you that you don't exist. At least you don't exist in the way that most people think, automatically think that, that we exist. That in an important sense, our se Cartesian self-understanding is mostly an illusion. And of course, there is an evolutionary psychological account of why do we have this illusion, right? So it's an illusion, but there's also an explanation for why this illusion exists. And when I say, talk about the convergence of the two worldviews, Buddha, Marx, and Foucault talk about how you don't exist, but also physics and biology talks about how you don't exist. And also neuroscience and cognitive science talks about how you don't exist, right? So this is convergence. Okay, so I have been going for, for, for quite some time. So this is a provisional lecture plan. So uh, uh, um, we're going to have, uh, uh, you know, 14, 15, 16 lectures. Again, depending on the schedule, these things change from year to year. But, but these are the 12 topics that I want to cover in these 14 lectures, right? So uh, uh, definitely beginning with the ideas of naturalism. Naturalism, materialism, physicalism. I'm using these terms, broadly speaking, synonymously. From <laughs> Thales to Darwin, right? Uh, 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 uh. Then, obviously, a very important topic, again, which I already mentioned, is, again, how... Uh, uh, epistemology means theory of knowledge that actually science doesn't really uh, to give us truth with capital T. In fact, as far as we can tell, human mind is limited. We don't have access to apodictic truths with capital T, right? So, <laughs> kind of, this is in principle unavailable. Science appears to be our best method of arriving closer to the truth, but there's nothing bulletproof. About science, so I'm telling you a very ambitious picture, but at the same time, this ambitious picture is not bulletproof by any, by any standard, by any stretch of imagination. And uh, you, you could talk about epistemology, theory of knowledge. You could talk about ancient epistemology, people like Sextus Empiricus. Say hi to Sextus Empiricus. You could talk about uh, 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 um, classical modern epistemology, uh, people like Descartes, Hume, or Kant. Or you could talk about contemporary epistemology from the logical positivists, people like Moritz Schlick. Uh, um, falsificationism of Karl Popper, and also the kind of the sociological approaches of philosophers such as Thomas Kuhn and Paul Feyerabend. Right? So uh, um, definitely we're going to devote some time to that in the lectures, and definitely feel free to choose this as your presentation topics. Then, again, again, trying to go from protons to presidents, at some point we need to talk about phenomenology and psychoanalysis. So Heidegger and Freud, or maybe Heidegger and Lacan, let's put it that way. Uh, um, then I'd love to devote some time to this ideas of evolution of culture and rationality. There's a whole bunch of people who have been, a uh, um, whole bunch of names who have become recently very popular. People like Robert Sapolsky, for example, or there's a, a brilliant uh, uh, course, wonderful course, um, available from the Yale University by Stephen Stearns, course on evolution. Right, so got ideas of kind of evolutionary theory, evolution, like oh, by Paul Bloom, for example. Right, evolution of culture and rationality. Daniel Kahneman, I already mentioned. Right. 
uh, uh, this is kind of the hard sciences outside approach to the evolution of culture and rationality. But then there's this other uh, kind of social theoretical, social science humanities approach to evolution of culture and rationality. And this is social theory, the that especially, I would say, the most important uh, uh, idea in social theory. If you take this wonderful book, for example, by Alex Klinikas, and we're going to be using, we're going to be reading from this book in our course. Um, the most important idea there is the transition from pre-modern traditional to the modern societies. And I'm thinking of philosophers such as, well, to some extent, Rousseau and Hegel, but more importantly, Durkheim, Marx, and Weber. Durkheim, Marx, and Weber, the classical social theory. Mm -hmm. So then when we talk about the, the, the questions of value, and I'm going to have to get to this in a second, right? So there's this idea of the project of enlightenment. It's a very important notion how... Uh, kind of a certain spin on the idea of the scientific revolution that to, in the same way that we can understand the laws of nature and therefore reshape nature uh, to fit our purposes, right? in the same fashion, the Enlightenment talks about how we can understand the laws of society and reshape society in a harmonious fashion, especially such that there is no conflict between the interest of the individual and of the community, kind of this Enlightenment optimism of philosophers such as Hobbes, Rousseau, and Hegel, right? And then we're going to talk about the, the limitation of the Enlightenment prospect. We're going to talk about Marx and the Marxist perspective. And I want to look at Marx less as a kind of political prophet of communism. And I want to look more at Marx as this, you know, structural analyst, right? Marx, like Nietzsche, like Freud, somebody who examines the human subjectivity and talks about how the human subject, as opposed to Descartes, the human subject is a product of larger forces, of, you know, of cultural evolution. To see, to see Marx as a social theorist, not not for his political insights, but for his analytical, analytic first and foremost, for, for his analytic, uh, social theoretical insights. Because again, Marx gives a certain mechanistic, non-teleological, anti-teleological account of human history, right? And of course, also Nietzsche, Nietzsche critique of uh, enlightenment, uh, rationality, anticipating ideas in Freud. That's an important part of the story. And, and Foucault, in many ways, just continues down the line. Uh, um, I want to say kind of the simplest, the easiest way to summarize Foucault is as, as a synthesis of Marx and Nietzsche. Uh, uh, at some point, definitely, I want to talk about Weber. Maybe before Foucault, we'll see how it goes, partly because my understanding of Marx is deeply Weberian, and, and, and Weber, who was supposed to begin as this uh, uh, in right, the champion of the teleological approach, Understand, understanding sociology, human beings as rational, as, as autonomous agents. But actually, if you look closely at Weber, right, at Weber's thought, he constantly talks about his iron cages, especially iron cage of rationalization, Stalhartes Gehauser, right? Kind of how this uh, 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 disenchantment, rationalization, again, the structural forces, we, we, we can see this transition from the teleological to the mechanistic worldview in the works of Max Weber. Wonderful. Uh, I wanted. To, I, I mentioned that in terms of complexity, the uh, international relations comes to the closest to the top. So I want to devote at least a lecture to give you some feel. Again, this is a philosophy and methodology of social sciences. So at least on some philosophical methodological level, give you a feel for what theory of international relations, theory of geop geopolitics looks like, theorizing globalization. My uh, uh, favorite perspective is uh, by Emmanuel Wallerstein, the world systems theory. So hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about that. And, and finally, again, to somehow to try to bring this back to the question of value, what should we do about this? Can humanity face up to the global challenges? Talk about, again, uh, 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 Antonio Gramsci and Jürgen Habermas, something like Jürgen Habermas, who tries to uh, um, somehow rescue the Enlightenment project as opposed to the critique. So, like, we're going to talk about the Enlightenment project, then we're going to criticize the Enlightenment project for one, two, three, four, maybe five lectures, and then we're going to try to rescue the Enlightenment project <laughs> by, you know, with, with potentially with the help of Antonio Gramsci and Jürgen Habermas, right? Something like this. So this is this is kind of a broad overview of the of the topics. So mm, as we go along, just maybe talk about this from a different perspective. So many of the questions that we're going to uh, uh, be talking about, and again, I invite you to when you look at these lists to think about what are the kinds of issues that maybe you want to focus on in your presentations and in your essays, like <laughs> what is nature, philosophy of physics, what is life, philosophy of biology, philosophy of evolution, what is consciousness. 
from evolutionary psychological perspective, you know, uh, Turing test, strong AI, that kind of thing, right? Uh, um, but also these issues, so this is, this is one part of the course. Another part of the course is issues of individual and society, classical social theory, Hegel, Marx, Foucault, but maybe also phenomenology, phenomenology psychoanalysis, Heidegger, Lacan. But also another, kind of a third aspect of our course is epistemology, how, how, what can we know? Classical modern epistemology, kind of the, the nature of scientific consensus, sociology of science. And kind of the fourth aspect of our course is the question of value, question of value. What should I do? What should we do? And is it possible to rescue the Enlightenment project? This is just me trying to map the 14 uh, or, or maybe the 12 topics that I listed out to try to map them thematically, right? Anyway, anyway, anyway. Um, anyway, yeah, so I think I mentioned this already. Mm. I'm going to skip all this for now. <clears throat> so finally, again, my uh, 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 sec second attempt at a, uh, uh, at a, at a wrap-up of this um, presentation, because in principle I tried to keep this short, but <laughs> of course <laughs> slightly longer than I planned. But anyway, so the question is, of course, once we understand all this, what do we do about it? What do we do about it, right? So... I mentioned that uh, uh, kind of at the end, the, 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 the I teach political theory and philosophy of science, and they are intertwined. Science is political, but also philosophy of science leads us to ask questions about politics. So let's talk about the questions of value. What do we do about all this? So I want to say that proper understanding of moral and political philosophy, you know, especially you know, starting with Hobbes and with Nietzsche and today with Marx and with Foucault, leads us to understand that there's no such thing as capital V values. The, this universe, in the words of Immanuel Kant, is the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter. There are mechanistic, blind mechanistic causes, but there are no deep purposes in nature. Again, as Hobbes says, whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite or desire is that which man calls good. But there's nothing simply or absolutely good or evil, right? One person plants flowers, another person plant, uh, eats children, and, you know, both of these interactions are just, you know, uh, 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 quantum fluctu fluctuations in the quantum fields seeking lowest energy states, right? <laughs> in, in the inexorable, <laughs> inexorable evolution of, uh, uh, of the cosmos towards uh, uh, greater entropy, right? So, but, but what should we do about this? So there's no such thing as, this picture leads us to see that there's no such thing as capital V values, but there are only small V values, which are rooted in, uh, uh, individual desires and collective common interest, common interest. But there's there's nothing, nothing over and above individual desire and common interest. So I mean, obviously, it's 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 a more complicated story than just that. And how do you know what your desires are? Can you do something about to reshape your desires? How do you exactly arrive at the common interest? How do you implement it? How do you find it out? These are complicated, you know, technical questions, but, I, you know, that, that's the provisional conclusion, right? So the nature of human predicament, and I, I'm going to, again, mostly like loosely quoting Heidegger, is that we find ourselves thrown into this world. We find ourselves thrown into this world without a manual and in expectation of death, which is going to, <laughs> destroy, you know, cross out all of the projects that we had in our lives, right? So we, we find ourselves strung between the groundlessness in the past and anxiety of the future, before the future, right? So why am I here? Why am I giving this lecture? Heidegger and Freud and Nietzsche seems to suggest, I don't know, I don't know. I find myself with certain beliefs, values, and desires, but I haven't chosen them. I'm thrown into this condition. And again, in some sense, you know, I, I say certain words, but is it me speaking a language or is it language speaking through me? Uh -huh. These words that I say, do I even understand the meaning of these words? Product, I am a product of larger force of biological and cultural evolution. It's not me speaking a language, it's some language speaking from, through me. But at the same time, you know, uh, this anxious being that I am, my existence is always an issue for me. Reminiscence, reminiscence of Schopenhauer, right? That uh, we are we are driven beings. We are driven by desires. Life uh, uh, can never be without desire, says um, Hobbes, right? And also, this talking about Schopenhauer, there's a certain kind of Buddhist overtone to this in my, in my own head, right? So our existence is always an issue for us. We cannot choose, it seems, not to care about our existence, yet. You know, we find ourselves in this predicament, but we find ourselves together. We are in this together. 
And so the, the provisional tentative precarious tentative conclusion is that we can have a free and equal discussion in the space of civil society. Uh -huh. And kind of this commitment to dialogical common project, project centered around common interest, dialogue about common interest, right? So there's, there's, a, there's an element of this in Buddhism, in Marxism, in psychoanalysis, in post-structuralism as well. But again, as I, as I, as I mentioned, so Buddhism, Marxism, and post-structuralism are the three modes of thinking which are most important which have been most important for me, you know, throughout my intellectual career. And as I'm teaching this course, I have psychoanalysis here on the board. I'm going to leave it as psychoanalysis, but, you know, Lacan is equally a psychoanalytic thinker and a post-structuralist thinker, right? And so, but we have to understand that kind of in this universe, which is <laughs> moving towards this max state of maximum entropy, again, this is a picture due to Sean Carroll, a wonderful physicist from uh, Caltech, uh, uh, right? The idea is that, you know, it's, it's a strange kind of positive project because... There is no paradise. There is no utopia. There is no happy ending to, to our picture. The universe ends, you know, in this bleak state of heat death. So the only thing that we can do is for a time to secure a measure of comfort in this chaotic world. As Freud says, to, the goal of psychoanalysis is to substitute neurotic misery for ordinary human unhappiness. But still, still, it seems that we're, we're in this together. And again, I invite you colleagues to, uh, 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 you know, hopefully, uh, to some extent, again, in this course, I, hopefully, you will find this course helpful, and I will find your company helpful, you know, in this broader, overarching goal of trying to, you know, to unscrew ourselves, to find our way, to, to secure a measure of comfort in this chaotic world, right? Uh, you know, this, this ideal of philosophy in Epicurus, in Socrates maybe, in Epicurus, but also, also uh, in David Hume, philosophy is a dialogue between friends that we engage in, for the purpose of enjoyment. And I, I do hope, I have found this dialogue to be enjoyable in the past, which is why I continue to do this, and I do hope that you will find this enjoyable, right? But when we talk about this uh, 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 free sphere of civil society, this free and equal discussion, democratic dialogue about common interest, right? This, this is at the danger of being subverted by these larger forces of biological and cultural evolution. And uh, uh, to me, again, in, in especially in Marx and in Foucault, the biggest challenge to this picture is the kind of this global state capitalist system, right? So it, it, is, it is capitalism, but it is capitalism which is joined with, with state sovereignty, with sovereign states. There are these coercive laws of market competition and coercive laws of bureaucratic state competition. And sometimes people talk about how there's a dichotomy between market and the state. I think it's a false dichotomy. We're trying to protect the sphere of free and equal discussion of civil society from the intrusion of the coercive laws of the market, of the corporations, if you want, and from the intrusion of the coercive laws of state competition, from governmental bureaucracy. We're trying to protect this sphere. We're trying to protect, fight against this drive towards efficiency for the sake of efficiency. Again, uh, uh, um, uh, Marx talks about alienation and exploitation. Uh, Heidegger, uh, well, uh, uh, Weber talks about uh, disenchantment and rationalization. Uh, um, um, they, uh, uh, Heidegger talks about the technological understanding of being. So let me write the, these three names: Marx, Weber, and Heidegger. Right? Technological understanding of being. How this uh, drive of efficiency for efficiency's sake, and how the social system dominates individuals, and and we dominate each other, and we dominate ourselves, and become unhappy through that. Oh yeah, I have these words here: alienation, rationalization, exploitation. And again, in, like in many ways, you know, it's like Bourdieu talks about sociology as a martial art, uh, or, or 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 Socrates in the dialogue Alcibiades talks about how the task of philosophy is to unlearn all of the un, unhelpful things that society has has implanted into our head. Right? I see the task of philosophy again, this practical therapeutical task of philosophy, philosophy as self defense against these forces of alienation, rationalization, and exploitation. And again, hopefully, we are in this together. We're trying to defend ourselves individually and collectively. Right? And so, right, so a different way of putting it, so a wonderful phrase from, again, a beautiful uh, 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 Italian intellectual whose name is Antonio Gramsci, who talks about this pessimismo dell'intelligenza, ottimismo della volontà. So pessimism of the intellect, but optimism and yet optimism of the will. So you, we go from this enlightenment optimism of philosophers such as Hobbes, Rousseau, and Hegel, this idea of the strength of the nation derived only from the free and eager consent of the citizens, right? The free consent 
to the rational laws, kind of free obedience. You obey, and yet you obey only freely because you choose to obey. You are rational, and the laws of your society are rational, and therefore you freely choose to obey the rational laws. This is kind of the Enlightenment optimism, right? This is the optimism of the will. But we, we go from this to the anxiety and the suspicion of this mechanistic picture of Marx, Nietzsche, and Foucault, right, who are unmasking the ideological indoctrination, the progressive exploitation, alienation, and ultimate potential self-destruction of humanity. Right? So it's, it's very easy now in the 21st century to imagine humanity destroying itself. Right? Potential self-destruction of humanity, humanity which is enslaved by the structural pursuit of efficiency for the sake of efficiency. Again, not because we have chosen, but because we, have, we, we are victims of these larger forces of biological and cultural evolution, which manufacture us and take control of control us. Right? And so in many ways, mm, kind of the ultimate question that we're going to have to grapple with is the question, is humanity doomed? Is the project of enlightenment, this rationalist project, is it doomed, right? So uh, Nietzsche and Freud talk about the deep irrationalism of uh, uh, human condition, how humans are deeply irrational. I can add Daniel Kahneman just for fun, uh, although I don't imagine that Kahneman <laughs> is an equally impressive thinker to Nietzsche and Freud, right? So we talk about disenchantment, rationalization, efficiency for the sake of efficiency, technological understanding of being in Mar Marx, Weber, and Heidegger, right? Again, this idea of the death of the subject, how I don't really speak the language, but the language speaks through me, and I don't even really understand the words of the language that, that I speak, right? So, like, like Lacan, Foucault. You could probably talk about, you know, structural linguistics like uh, Ferdinand de Saussure or Claude Lévi-Strauss, right? Right, it's kind of this global state capitalist system, you know, imperialist system. Uh, we'll have an occasion maybe to mention at least a little bit for people like John Hobson, Vladimir Lenin, right, who talks about imperialism as a stage of capitalism, and Emmanuel Wallerstein has to do with again in, 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 geopolitics, uh, right? And so all of this is the, this is the pessimism, right? So enlightenment is doomed says Nietzsche, Freud, and Kahneman, because we are irrational. Enlightenment is doomed, say Marx, Weber, and Heidegger, because we have this drive for efficiency for efficiency's sake. Enlightenment is doomed, says Lacan and Foucault, because I don't even speak the language, language speaks through me. Enlightenment is doomed, say Hobbes and Lenin and Wallerstein, because we are enslaved by this global system of state capitalism, right? And, but Habermas and Gramsci and Pierre Bourdieu and Michael Borovoy dare to hope. Pessimism, this, this, is, this is the pessimism of the intellect, and this is the optimism of the will. So in Habermas, there's the hope for the civil society of free and equal discussion, right? So this peculiarly unforced force of the better argument. And notice, notice that this is political, but this is also scientific because science is also supposed to be democratic. Science is also supposed to be based on this ideal of free and equal discussion. Science is also supposed to be based on this peculiarly unforced force of the better argument, as Habermas uh, calls it, the Zwang closing Zwang, the Spessern arguments, the peculiar unforced force of the better argument. Again, notice how this mm, ideal of the free and equal discussion, ideal of this democratic dialogue, we, kind of this is the this is going to be the end of our course in Habermas, but this is also the beginning of our course, broadly speaking, the beginning of uh, Western philosophical tradition in the works in you know <laughs> in the practice philosophical practice of Socrates. Kind of kind of this there's this interesting overarching topic, how the beginning and the end join together. Again, the free and equal dialogue in Habermas, which points back to Socrates. Again, the peculiarly unforced force of the better argument, right? So, maybe to just wrap this up, <laughs> sometimes, uh, this is a discussion I'm kind of tempted to not really have anymore, but let me verbalize it, right? Sometimes people ask me, why study philosophy? I want to say, in many ways, it's a very strange question. I feel that these, these issues that I have raised, these are the most important, the most interesting questions that anybody in the 21st century can think about. Philosophy is luxury. It's kind of liberal arts education, the education of a free person, of a free citizen. If you can afford the free time to engage in these discussions, to engage in these thoughts, of course you would. In many ways, a strange question. And, but like, if you have the capacity, of course you would think about these issues. But of course, if you do not, think about these topics. Others think for you, kind of ideological indoctrination, right, aspect. Is, Socrates says, is the unexamined life worthy of a human being, right? So, so again, these, these great questions, what are we? Where do we come from? What does the future hold? What, and what can we do about it, individually and collectively? Aren't these the biggest questions? 
uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. And if we do not think about these questions for ourselves, isn't it the case that others think for us? Is the unexamined life worthy of a human being? So colleagues, colleagues, <laughs> wrapping up finally, I hope you have found this little presentation enjoyable. And let me invite you into, dial into the dialogue to examine these fundamental questions in the company of the greatest minds of the Western philosophical tradition, of the Western philosophical tradition, but also, you know, we're going to try to bring in maybe some insights from other <laughs> uh, philosophical traditions, especially the ancient Chinese philosophical tradition and uh, uh, Buddhist, philosophical tra which, Buddhist philosophical tradition, which is something I know about a little bit. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to incorporate this uh, uh, into the lectures, but I'll, I'll try. But definitely, I definitely welcome uh, your explorations of these traditions outside of the West uh, in terms of your presentations and essays. So anyway, colleagues, I hope this was fun. I hope this was stimulating. I hope this makes you enthusiastic <laughs> to jump right into the course. So until next time, stay safe, take care, and I will see you around.